Okay. Yeah. So welcome back. Uh, so today's uh, last lecture uh, will be given by uh, Professor Jae Song Lee. Uh, actually, he's, this is uh, his last lecture. <laughs> uh, lecture series, yes. Okay. okay. So, uh, okay, please. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so this is my last lecture. So yesterday, I talked about um, T uh, TUR. So um, this this is a form of TUR. Right, so and this holds for overdent uh, Langevin system and Markov jump process. Okay, and and this holds in the steady state. This is important. And also, additionally, we also showed this KUR kinetic uncertainty relation for Markov jump process. It also holds in the steady state. So these two relation holds in uh, the steady state. So uh, one of you yesterday asked me then what happens if the system is not in, not in the steady state. So I mean, yeah, that's a very important question. So some modification is necessary uh, to, uh, I mean, for this arbitrary state case. So this is TUR with arbitrary state when arbitrary time dependent protocol is given. So this holds for um, over dental Langevin system and Markov jump process. So this is the modification. The other things are same. So the modification, so here we put some operator in front of this average of observable. So here tau is final time and omega is protocol change speed. So for example, if there is no protocol, which means that uh, omega equal to zero, then this term goes out. And in the steady state, actually uh, applying this to uh, in front of this observable value in the steady state, actually this is nothing but just observable average. So, so in the steady state, uh, this um, this equation inequality returns back to this original steady state TUR. So this is a modification. And then what about under dental Langevin dynamics? So actually, uh, these are I mean these are holes for over dental Langevin dynamics. Then so um, so this is a TUR with arbitrary state when arbitrary time dependent protocol is given for under dental Langevin dynamics. So similar to this previous case, in front of this observable average, we have to put some operator. And additionally, we have to put some, I mean, some constant uh, here, I. So here I is related to initial Shannon entropy. So a little bit uh, becomes a little bit complicated. But anyway, uh, when we take over to limit, which means that m over gamma goes to zero limit, then we can show that this expression uh, goes to, I mean, this uh, TUR in the steady state. So in this way, actually, these, um, these TURs are consistent to theory each other. OK. So, um, thi so this is a, some, some variance of TUR in arbitrary state, an arbitrary protocol is given, and for under dental Langevin dynamics. Okay. And then, um, actually, I prepared some, uh, some how to apply TUR uh, to some experimental situation, but uh, because of time, so I will, I will skip that part. And then I want to go to the lecture four today. So, uh, I mean, so this is a schematic uh, of a stochastic system we are interested in. So uh, t equals zero is, so t equals zero is initial time, t equal tau is final time, and these are initial states, and these are final states. So this initial state constitute this initial distribution. 
and final state constitute final distribution. Okay, and gamma is stochastic trajectories. So we are interested in observable, observable theta. Uh, so for example, there are heat, work, and displacement, and some, so on. And this is entropy production, which is a function of gamma. So, um, so actually now we want to find the general relation between uh, these quantities. So yesterday uh, we learned TUR. So TUR is a relation between the observable and entropy production. So, so as I showed you in the, in the first page, uh, it looks like this. So, I mean, this is a, a relative variance uh, and a relative fluctuation, and this is a um, entropy production. So, as I explained yesterday, it is a kind of a trade-off relation. So, we have to pay more thermodynamic cost for reducing fluctuation. This is the meaning of uh, TUR. And today, and actually, so this is a relation between these two, observable and entropy production. And what about this, um, this measurable quantity, which is a distribution? Distribution is also a measurable quantity, right? So today, I'm going to talk about thermodynamic speed limit, which is a relation between these distributions and entropy production. Okay, so let's suppose uh, this situation. So here, P0 is initial distribution, any, any initial distribution of a system. And this is a final distribution of a system. So we want to move this initial state, P0, to final state during a finite time tau. Let's suppose that this situation then this inequality holds. So uh, let me explain the meaning of this uh, inequality. So tau is transition time from initial state to the final state, final distribution. So this is a transition time, and this is entropy production. And this A bar, uh, A bar, you can think it as a dynamical activity, which is a number of jumps, number of transitions during the process. And here, DTVPQ, P and Q, it is called a total variation distance. And actually, this is a one, one of the distance between two distributions, P and Q. So here, there are two distributions, P0 and P tau, initial distribution, final distribution. So, I mean, this is a distance between the initial and final distribution. So I will, um, I will explain the explicit definition of these uh, two quantities uh, in the next slide. So, okay, so let's look at this equation. So, for example, if we reduce this uh, total transition time, then from this inequality, it means that entropy production should, be, should increase. Or if we want to reduce entropy production, then uh, the transition time should increase. So roughly saying it is also kind of a trade-off relation. So we have to pay more thermodynamic cost for faster transition. It is quite intuitive to understand, right? So, uh, so this is the meaning of this uh, uh, speed limit. Okay. So dynamic activity is also constant? Uh, here, so okay, I will show you the definition later. Uh, of course, I mean, this term it also depends on some protocol. So actually, this is not constant. So that's why I say roughly saying, roughly saying it is a trade-off relation. But anyway, this is a positive number. So any other question? Okay, no, if no, then. And conventionally, we write um, the speed limit in this way by moving this entropy term to the right-hand side in this way. 
OK, so in lecture, in lecture four, uh, in the first section, uh, I will show you how to derive this speed limit. And in the second section, uh, I will show you how to apply this speed limit to the problem of finite time lambda was bound. Okay. Okay, so this is a speed limit, and the motivation of the study of this speed limit is actually the quantum speed limit, which was introduced in 1945. So this quantum speed limit um, is about the closed quantum system. Actually, it is, it is for closed quantum system. So let's say that this is the initial state of a quantum system, and this is a final state of the quantum system, closed quantum, quantum system. So the evolution is unitary, of course. Uh, so this is a quantum speed limit. So the transition time is larger than this value. Here, L is some kind of, um, some kind of distance between two states. So the thing is that if we take how bar goes to zero limit, which is a classical limit, then you see that this term becomes a zero. So actually, in, in this limit, the, the quantum speed limit uh, becomes trivial. I mean, it, it, is, it means that transition time is non-negative. It's a very trivial statement. So uh, people asked then, then whether there is a, some meaningful and useful um, speed limit in a cl classical system. OK. I know me. I mean, it, it, it is I mean, for any Hamiltonian, and but closest quantum system. So it is a evolution. It's a unitary evolution. Yeah. But uh, in that case, why there is a restriction in time? So if we have an arbitrary strong power, we can make the transition arbitrary uh, power. So are there Uh, actually, I, I don't know well about this theory, but as far as I know, I mean, this is a general uh, bound, so I, I don't know whether there is a, some restriction for Hamiltonian. So it, it holds for, I mean, general, uh, some unitary evolution case with a certain Hamiltonian uh, for closed quantum system. Sorry, I cannot hear you. Uh, yeah. You're taking uh, h bar the very small limit. Yes. But that means that you're looking at the classical system that is deterministic, not the stochastic system. Um. I mean, I mean this this limit is a. We know that this is a. I mean the classical limit. So. Quantum, quantum to continuous state space. So that's why I, I say that this is a classical limit. But anyway, this is a closed system. So your question is that then this limit goes to the, some thermodynamic. No, no. No. I, 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 I ask because you compare two different things. Because this is a deterministic one, and the whole one is. Ah, yes, right, right, right. I mean, I mean, so I mean, this is a simple, I mean, simple limitation. So, so one one trial. So, so we want to see that what happens if we take a classical limit, whether there we can have some meaningful, I mean, uh, speed limit in a classical situation. But a, anyway, if we take this kind of a classical limit, then we cannot find any meaningful 
I mean, speedily meaning a classical system. But of course, I mean, I'm dealing with a classical system, even though it is an open system. So, I mean, that's why people asked whether there is a meaningful uh, classical limit in a classical, in, in classical system. And so that's why it becomes a motivation to study a uh, speed limit in a thermodynamic classical system. Yeah. But of course, uh, nowadays people are also uh, studying the quantum speed limit for open system, open thermodynamic system. So then we can, uh, then we can derive similar, uh, similar structure, similar inequality in such an open uh, quantum system. Okay, so, uh, so this is a mo motivation. So, okay, so this is a speed limit. And in this lecture, uh, I will focus only on the uh, discrete state model, which is a Markov jump process. Of course, we can consider um, Langevin dynamics with continuous states, but in, if we consider uh, the Langevin dynamics, we have to use um, other distance measures such as a so-called Wasserstein distance. But here I will not uh, talk about the Wasserstein distance. So here in this lecture, I'll only focus on the Markov jump process. Okay, so this is a system setup. So uh, the master equation, so R and M is a transition rate from M state to N state at time T, and PN is a probability of state N at time T. And entropy production rate, we learned how to write entropy production rate in terms of rate, uh, transition rate, and probability. Of course, this speed limit uh, can be derived when we use different entropy production. For example, uh, this same, in, same inequality holds for when we use Hatanosa's entropy production or a non adiabatic entropy production. We learned the, what is a Hatanosa's entropy production y yesterday or the day, okay, yesterday. So anyway, uh, it, this inequality holds for Hatanosa's entropy production, but for simplicity in this lecture, I'll only focus on this just uh, total entropy production rate. And this is a, a dynamical activity rate. So this is nothing but the number of jumps rate. So th this is a definition of a dynamical activity rate. So by integrating uh, this dynamical activity rate from time zero to tau, then it gives the total number of jumps, right, during the process. So we call it total activity. And this A bar uh, is defined by total activity divided by total time. So it is a mean activity. So here, this A bar means mean activity here. And finally, this one, DTV, Q, and P, and Q, is called total variation distance. And the definition is, looks like this. So there are two distributions, P and Q. So it measures how, how far each, how far they each other. So uh, you can check that this distance is in between zero and one. So when the two distributions are exactly same, then actually it becomes zero. So, uh, so when, when, when these two distributions are same and it becomes zero, and th when the two distributions are completely different, then it becomes one. So it is a measure for distance between these two distributions. Is it like Kuruak-Lipler? A different, different one. I, I'll, I'll explain it later. Okay. That's a very, I mean, good question. There is actually the relation between this one and Kuruak-Lipler cool divergence. Okay, so um, for simplicity, uh, I will use the notation curly L to denote this total variation distance. So we can simply write a speed limit in this way, simple way. Okay, so uh, this inequality, speed limit, 
was first derived. And this is the first, I mean, proposed form uh, in uh, 2018, and of course it was derived in 2020. Uh, but here in this lecture, I will introduce you some general form of speed limit. What I mean by general is that from this relation, we can derive this, uh, the first proposed form. So if we know how to derive this, then we can automatically derive uh, this result. Okay, so to derive this general form, we have to start from this key relation. So this key relation, key inequality means that there exists some convex function h, convex function h, which satisfy this inequality. So I will show you how to derive this key relation later, but at <coughs> this point, please accept this inequality first, and then by dividing the same factor here for both sides of equation, uh, divide by same factor, and then here we define function g of x, h of x divided by 2x. Then let's look at this left term. Then you see that actually this is a form of g of x function, right? This is argument x. So by changing this as a g of x and then taking the inverse function of g, then we can have this inequality. Finally, then from this relation, now we change uh, this relation to this one, so uh, we can derive this uh, general form. So now we know how to derive from this key relation to this general form. So the remaining task we have to do is that uh, we have to know how to derive this key relation. Okay, so uh, no question. Up to this point. Okay. G must have some monotonic property to be applied, right? S sorry, G function? The G function, if in order to be able to invert the inequalities, must be monotonic. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. You're right. It should be some kind of monotonic function in some specific, I mean, the for interested range. Okay, so. So this is a definition of um, total variation distance. So distance between two distribution. And this is the same for this integration, right? And then uh, from the triangle inequality, this term uh, is larger, uh, smaller than this one. And from this master equation, here we plug this, this term into this one. Then the result is like this. Oh, sorry, this is typo. This should be deleted. And then this one, uh, it should be small, smaller than this one from the triangle inequality. Okay, so up to this point, it's very easy. And so the uh, total variation distance is smaller than this equation. Now, I will define some function q and q star in this way. So q and m is related to this first term, and q star is related to this second term, and divided by a dot. a dot is a, um, a dynamical activity rate. So this is a dynamical activity rate, but you, you see that actually this is a kind of a normal, normalization constant. So it means that this Q and Q star variables are actually the, we can regard Q and Q star as a probability because this is a normalized quantity. So by using this definition, we can rewrite this equation in this way. And then, this is actually the definition of uh, uh, total variation distance. So total variation distance Q and Q star is actually this one. So by using this relation, we can rewrite this term 
by using the total variation distance in this way. Okay. <clears throat> now, I will use some important property of the statistical distance and their relations. So, this is a total variation distance, I explained. So it is in between 0 and 1. When the two distributions are exactly the same, it becomes 0. And completely different, it becomes 1. And there is a, uh, this is a Kohlberg library divergence, as you, as you asked. So this is the definition of a Kohlberg library divergence. When you see that when two distributions are exactly the same, it becomes 0. So it is similar to this total variation distance. However, actually it does not have upper bound. Actually it can be infinite, it can diverge. So there is some relation between the total variation distance and the Kohlberg library divergence in this way. So there exists some convex function h which satisfy this inequality. It means that the h, h of total variation distance is smaller than Kohlberg library divergence. So this is an important uh, relation between these two, uh, I mean distance and diver divergence. So um, I will show you the exp I will show you explicit form of this convex function h later, but here let's accept this inequality. This is a well-known inequality in information science. So, uh, so by using this inequality and taking the inverse function of h, then we can show that this uh, uh, total variation distance is smaller than this, this quantity. And here, because of this is a convex, h is a convex function, then the inverse, its inverse is a concave function. Now, uh, with this def definition of q and q star, now we can calculate this Kohlberg library divergence, q and q star. So it can be written in this way, and now you probably you are familiar with now this expression. This expression is about the entropy production rate, right? And divide by this, uh, tot I mean, uh, dynamical activity rate. So by using this e equation, uh, we can write in this way. And now here, uh, let's uh, divide by A and multiply by A, the sa same thing, and then because now this becomes such some normalized quantity, I mean, so we can regard it as a probability because it can be normalized. So it is like an average value of this H inverse function. And as I, as I explained that, and this is H is a convex function, and H inverse is a concave function. So it is inverse of Jensen's inequality. So uh, because this is a concave function, this is the average of this whole, whole function, and this is the average of this argument and h inverse function. So this is larger than this one. So this is a, a kind of a inverse of a Johnson's inequality we learned in the first day. So finally, these are cancel, canceled out. So the integration over this in, in entropy production rate gives a total entropy production. So we have this uh, conclusion. So I is there any question for this derivation? H inverse is also monopoly Yes, right. Dynamical activity at times zero is zero. Ta uh, this one? Or, or this, this one? I mean, this is positive number. Yeah, positive number. I mean, uh, this one. Uh, no, the first, very first point, yeah. uh, this one. Uh, so dynamical activity. This one. Uh, yeah. So in the next slide. 
A dot by A of tau. Yeah, the, uh, this one. Yeah, yeah, this one. Yes. You said this is probability like. Yeah, probability because if we integrate out this one, then it becomes A tau. It's A tau minus A zero, right? A tau minus A. I mean, um, A zero is a zero. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. A zero is a zero. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because uh, the, the definition of a, a t is that uh, total number of jumps during the process from time 0 to tau, actually, so when t go, tau goes to 0, actually, the total number of jumps is 0. So that's why a0 is 0. OK. So, any other question? OK, if no. Okay, so I showed that the total variation distance is smaller than this number. So by moving this term to the left-hand side and by taking the inverse function of this, then finally we have this key relation. So this is a way to derive this key relation. And there is one important property of this uh, kolbeck liver divergence here. So. Um, this is a kolbeck liver divergence of Q and Q star. But you see that this uh, indices N and M are actually dummy variable, dummy indices. So we can exchange them. So this is it, the exchange it, uh, indices. But this is actually the kolbeck liver divergence of Q star and Q. So you see that. In our case, uh, the Q, Q star, and Q star, Q are same, give the same divergence. So in, in our case, the Kohlbeck library divergence is symmetric. But this is, in general, they are not symmetric. It, it is not, Kohlbeck library divergence is not symmetric in general. But in our case, by using this Q and Q star, we can show that Kohlbeck library divergence is symmetric. So I mean, this is, I mean, I will use this uh, uh, property uh, in the next uh, derivation. So please remember this property in, in our case. Okay, so because now we know how to derive this Q relation, so uh, we finally derive this general form. Okay, now uh, let me show you then the explicit form of this convex function H. Okay, so this is a, a, a relation between the total variation distance and kolbeck liver divergence. And one simple example of H function is a Pinsker function, which is given by 2x squared. So very simple uh, function satisfy this inequality. But I mean, the der I mean, I'll not show how to derive it, but you can, you can see the derivation in the information science book, textbook. But anyway, so we are now considering two kind of distance. This is a distance, but it is not distance. But anyway, uh, the, it is in between 0 and 1, and it is larger than 0. So let's consider two simple, uh, uh, two simple distributions. So first, P distribution is 0, 1, and Q distribution is 1, 0. <coughs> so uh, we can calculate the total variation distance by using these two distributions. Uh, this is a calculation. So you can check that the total variation distance is equal to 0. So it means that two distributions are completely different. And of course, we can calculate the kolbeck liver divergence here. So due to this term, actually, it diverges. So uh, by putting this number to this inequality by using this Pinsker function, we can easily check that this inequality holds. Right? Yes, so this inequality holds, but, but very loosely holds. Which, what I mean by loose is that the number here is 2. And but here, the number is infinity. So 2 is smaller than infinity. It's very, very loosely, I mean, 
the, the bounded by, uh, this bound is very loose. This is what I mean by loose. So, so when uh, the total D is close to one, this Pinskov function gives a very loose bound, as we saw in this example. So the meaning of D is close to one is that, as we saw in this example, two distributions are I mean completely different, right? And the meaning of this D is close to zero is that two distributions are very much the same, very much the same. So when the two distributions are very much the same, then Kullback library divergence also is close to zero. So when, when D is close to zero, then Kullback library divergence also close to zero. Then when we put these two number to this inequality, in, in such a case, now it becomes uh, much tighter because now it becomes a zero, it's smaller than close to zero. So, so it means that pin square is very loose near d equal to one, but it, it becomes tight uh, when d is close to zero. Then wh what does it mean? So we are now considering this uh, a Kullback library divergence with q and q star, and the definition of a q and q star is given in this way. So uh, the meaning that two distributions are very much the same, which means that this is a forward, uh, forward direction uh, rate, and this is a backward direction rate. So, what, so the meaning that D is close to zero, and then two uh, rate are, e I mean, the almost, uh, I mean, they are equal, which means that the process is nearly reversible. And the meaning that D is close to one, and then these two rates are very much different, which means that the process is highly irreversible. So, so it means that the Pinsk curve function gives a very loose bound for highly irreversible process, but it gives a tight bound for only for nearly reversible process. So this is the meaning of uh, this bound, Pinsk curve bound. So do you, do you understand my point? Okay. So to enhance, to enhance this looseness near d is close to one, then we can use other functions. So for example, this is a Bretagne Huber function, and this is a Gilardoni function proposed by Gilardoni. So let me show you these three functions. So this x axis is uh, the total variation distance d and y-axis is this h function, and this blue curve uh, denotes a Pinsk curve function, and this g and a bh function denotes uh, this bh function, and g, this is a g function. So um, as you can see from this plot, uh, at d equal to one here, so p function is finite, uh, however this g and bh function diverge. And as we know from this example, uh, when d equal to one, uh, the, the Kullback library divergence diverges. So uh, these two functions actually uh, provide much tighter bound than the uh, Pinsker bound near uh, d equal one. Okay. But if the Kullback library divergence is symmetric in this special case, then we can use more tighter bound. So uh, this is a, a plot of this uh, tighter, tightest bound. So actually, this is tight everywhere compared to other functions. And as I mentioned that in our case, uh, the Kullback library divergence is symmetric. Right? So that's why the reason we can use this tightest bound in our, for our speed. Okay. So is it mathematically proven that there is no other mathematical form which is more tighter? Um, uh, precisely saying, uh, 
actually, I will show you the example. Then, then uh, I mean, this is a tie test uh, when the system has two states. We cannot find a tighter than this bound in when the when the state I and mean, when the system state has just only two states. But uh, um, I'm not sure whether, for example, a three state and four state model, which one is tightest. Okay. Information science, just I mean, are concerned this one. Uh, almost, I mean, they are almost a mathematician. Okay. Um, okay. So. So okay. So this is a general form of speed limit, and this is a definition of g. So for example, if we use this Pinsker function to x square, and then we can easily calculate this one. And this g, if we use this function, then it is simply x, gx equal to x, so identity function. So we can easily found that uh, this speed limit. And this is actually the first proposed form I uh, introduced you in the first page. So this is actually the previous result. Which means that this result is tight for only for nearly reversible process, but it becomes very loose. It 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 gives a very loose bound for highly irreversible process. However, if we use uh, this tightest bound, then uh, I will call this bound as a symmetric KLD bound. And then uh, uh, this is uh, I mean the uh, the speed limit form, then this is actually the tight for all processes. And this is actually gives a tightest bound. I'll show you one example, why I call this tightest. OK, so um, I explained the, the, how to derive the general form of uh, um, uh, speed limit. Um, but here, then I will show you how to derive this tightest uh, symmetric KLD bound. Okay, so what I want to is that what I want to do is that when the Kuhlman library divergence is symmetric, then I want to show that this gives the uh, bound between the Kuhlman library divergence and total variation distance in this form. Okay, so so this is a uh, total variation distance definition and square. Now I multiply by this term and divide by this term. So same thing. And here I use um, Cauchy Schwarz inequality. So this is square and this is square and their product. And because this summation gives one, and this summation gives number one. So actually, this summation gives number two. So that's why it becomes this one. And this uh, quantity is defined as a Lukem distance. So it means that uh, total variation distance is smaller than Lukem distance. And, and this is a, a re-expression of this Lukem distance. So uh, we can divide this term into two parts, this one and this one. And then here we divide by this quantity and multiply by this quantity. So this is a re-expression of this Lukem distance. And because you see that, I mean, the total variation distance is defined in this way. So this term is actually normalized quantity. If we sum over this, then it becomes one. So we can regard this term as a, some kind of a probability. So let's denote this term as p tilde n. 
And we can also uh, immediately show that the tangent type of omega of this function gives this value. You, you can check it by yourself. Then this is kind of, because of this is a probability, so this is kind of a average of this tangent type of oblique function, right? And then for, for positive uh, side, tangent type of oblique function is a concave function, right? So we can use the uh, inverse of Janssen's inequality. So uh, this is the average of a tangent type of oblique function, and this is the argument average and tangent type of oblique function. So this is larger than this quantity. And then, uh, by using the definition of p tilde, uh, we can now write uh, in this way. And this one, so this first, first part, first term, is this part. And the second term gives this part. So by defining this one as a symmetrized Kolbeck library divergence, so we can write in this way. This is diff actually different, in general, this is different from uh, this, this quantities. And so, um, by, by using this definition, then we can write in this way. So, because now this term is smaller than this term, so finally we have this inequality. And then by taking the inverse function of tangent type of then we can show this relation. And we know that tangent type of olic can be written in this way by using the logarithmic function. So you see that this function is actually the same as this one, right? And, and if the Kolbeck library divergence is symmetric, then in this case, ds is equal to d. So in this case, ds is equal to d. So in such a case, we can change ds equal to d. So finally, we derive uh, this inequality. In, in such a way, we can show uh, uh, this bound. So is there any question about this derivation? Is it clear? OK. So up to now, I talked about how to derive a, a general form of speed limit. And then now, from now on, I will, uh, I'm going to talk about how to apply this speed limit to the lambda finite time Landau bound problem. So what is Landau's bound? So it tells us that for erasing one bit of information, then at least kbt log to uh, heat should be dissipated. So it can be formulated in this way. Heat should be larger than kbt log 2. Then this minimum value, so this minimum bound is attained in the, only in the quasi-static limit, I mean the quasi-static erasing process. In such a case, so we can have this uh, minimum bound. We can approach this minimum bound. So for finite time process, uh, because a quasi-static limit takes uh, infinite time, so for finite time process, we can easily expect that some additional cost is necessary, right? So uh, from this series of studies, they found that this additional cost is proportional to 1 over tau. Here tau is uh, erasing time. So when tau goes to infinity, which is a quasi-static limit, then we can have this minimum bound. But if tau is very small, then this additional cost diverge. Okay, so this is a problem of a finite time Landau's bound. Okay, then what is erasing process? So let's suppose that there is one single memory, <coughs> one bit memory. So it, it can have uh, two states, one state and zero state. So when, when the system is in 
in this example, the system is in the zero state, so we read uh, this memory is in zero state. So uh, if there are many memories initially, then this is a one, one, zero, one, zero, something like that. So let's say that initially, uh, the probability for observing uh, the memory is in zero state is half, and the probability for observing the memory is in the steady, uh, in the state of one state, then it is also half. So initially, uh, the zero and one probability is given half and half. And then the erasing process means that it is nothing but reset to zero process. So after erasing process, the final state uh, will be like this. They are all reset to zero. So it means that probability observing zero, zero state is uh, probability equal to one, and probability observed the one state is zero. So th this is the meaning of erasing process. So erasing process is nothing but the distribution change from the initial distribution to the final distribution, half half distribution to the one one zero distribution. So, uh, so for this uh, distribution change, we can easily calculate the total variation distance, which is simply given by one half. And we can also calcul easily calculate the Shannon entropy change. And this is the result, I mean calculation result. So the answer is minus log two. So now we can use uh, our speed limit. So this is a general form of speed limit. And we, uh, if we rearrange uh, these terms, and then we can show that the entropy production is larger than this value. And here, uh, V is defined as L over MN, L divided by the total activity. And we know that entropy production can be divided into two parts. So this is a system entropy change, and this is a reservoir entropy change. So we know the what is a system entropy change. So this is a Shannon entropy change, is a system entropy change. And then this is a heat Q. So by plugging this equation into this inequality and arrange the terms, then we have this inequality. So it means that uh, dissipation heat is larger than KBT log two plus something else. So from this inequality, we can easily identify that this term is additional cost for finite um, process of erasing uh, erasure. So, I mean, this is the importance of a G function. I define the what is a G function. G function is HX divided by 2X. So this is the meaning of G function. Actually, it gives the additional cost. So, uh, for example, if we choose the Pinska function, H equal to 2X squared, then actually, in that case, it is a simply an identity function. So it becomes just uh, this number. And as you see from this factor, so it is proportional to, the additional cost is proportional to 1 over tau. Actually, this is a previously observed behavior. Uh, but um, uh, if, we, if we use this symmetric KLD bound, then we can calculate this additional cost. It becomes uh, this quantity. Uh, it is uh, different from this one. And here, uh, v, v is defined in this way. Uh, but it will give a tightest bound. So, so let, me, let me give you an example. Uh, so this is the, I mean, uh, this is a discrete one-bit model, and this is a coarse-grained bit model with a continuous uh, state space. So the discrete one bin model is actually it has a two state, a zero state and one state. So let's, uh, let's suppose that initially the state is in the one state here. So by, by raising the energy state of the one state, then we can move this system to the uh, one, uh, zero state here. 
and then lower the energy level again. So this is um, a process of er erasing process. So this is a, a discrete one bit model. And, but we can also play with a uh, Langevin system uh, with a coarser graining. So um, this is a, let's say that this is a Langevin system and this is a, some, um, some kind of a, some symmetric potential. <coughs> so uh, we can coarser grain in this way. If the particle, Brownian particle is uh, inside in this area, then we can read this system is in one state and if the particle is lo located in this area, we can read this system is in uh, zero state. In such a way, we can, we can do a coarse graining to the system and then uh, use this uh, continuous system as uh, some bit model. So that's why I call this one coarse grained bit model. So in this kind of model, uh, let's say that, let's suppose that initially the particle is in this one area and by applying some uh, um, asymmetric potential, then we can move the particle from one state to the uh, zero state. So in such a way, we can uh, erase the memory. So um, this is a result. Uh, so this is a, a calculation result of this discrete one bit model by using some protocol, by using this protocol. So uh, y axis is entropy production and x axis is uh, uh, inverse of V and V is defined in this way. And the reason why I plot x, x axis by using this v, inverse of V is that actually inverse of V is proportional to time tau. So you can, I mean, in, in large, in this limit, you can think uh, the v, inverse V is like uh, time. So uh, this is a plot of these two bounds. So the, this orange one is pin square bound and this blue dashed one is a symmetric KLD bound. And as you see from this plot, at v equal to one here, uh, at this limit, uh, the symmetric KLD bound diverges, but uh, the pin square bound is finite at this point. So let me magnify this area. Okay, so this is a magnified view. As you see from this plot, uh, the pin square bound, actually, pin, actually uh, the, the V equal to one, this area is highly irreversible area and this is a nearly reversible area. So in this highly irreversible process area, then pin square bound gives a very loose bound because it is a finite but data and symmetric KLD bound diverges. So, I mean, infinitely loose uh, bound, uh, uh, the pin square gives an infinitely loose bound. But you see that this symmetric KLD bound is really tight. I mean, it touches the data. And other three uh, uh, lines uh, is about the other H function, so Gilardoni and BH and Vajita functions. So you see that always they are looser than this symmetric KLD bound. And we can also find uh, the condition for opti optimal protocol, which means that the, the protocol which, which gives the result that touches uh, this tightest bound. So this red, red dot actually is uh, uh, the calculated from this optimal protocol. So it means that actually this is a really tight, tightest bound. And this uh, green dots, um, green dots is a simulation result from this coarse graining bit model by using uh, in the overdamped Langevin system by using this symmetric potential. And I mean, I, I derived this, uh, this uh, speed limit uh, from the discrete state system. I mean, I, I, I derived this speed limit from the master equation, Markov jump process. But 
our speed limit also can be applicable to this coarse-grained bit model with a continuous space. So, um, so this data, I mean this simulation data is really above this our bound, right? So I mean it, it, sh it, it clearly shows that our bound, I say this bound is clearly applicable to this continuous state space, but anyway, coarse-grained bit system. But uh, you see that there is a gap here, a large gap here. So this gap actually comes from the uh, process of a coarse graining. So to reduce this gap, actually, we have to use a different uh, distance measure, uh, such as a, a Weierstein distance, something like that. OK, so, um, so this is the final page. So, uh, in this lecture, final lecture, I talked about uh, the speed limit. So this is kind of a trade-off between time and thermodynamic cost. And so uh, I talked about how to derive this speed limit, general form of speed limit. So from this speed limit, we can derive the previously known speed limit form. And by using this uh, speed limit, we can apply this speed limit to the problem of finite time line that was bound, and it gives a really tightest bound. So this is all about my final lecture. OK, so that's all. OK, questions? Common? Compared, compared to this quantity, so... Uh, yeah, I mean, if... This is, I mean, it can diverge. So, I mean, if the time is very large, then this portion is, will be very small. But, so, in the highly irreversible limit, which, which means that the process is very fast in such a limit that actually it, I mean, it diverge. It can diverge, I mean, it, very, it can be very large compared to this one. So, I mean, it means that for our, I mean, our daily lives, I mean, our computing, erasing computing is very fast, right? So it means that uh, in such a case, I mean, it should be very, very much larger than this KBT log 2. Yes. Okay, uh, so your question is about probably this one. Uh, So you mean, yeah, here. So you mean that I calculated uh, by using this constant value. Yes, right. So actually, it depends on, uh, I mean, there is no perfect erase. I mean, there may be some small error, right? So error will depend on time and protocol and something like that. So we can actually write in this way. So it, when there is error, then we can write 1 minus epsilon and here epsilon. In such a case, we can also calculate it and it will be 1, one half pl plus something epsilon dependent term here. And also this Shannon entropy, some, uh, uh, this also depends on epsilon, but even though it has an error, so the, I mean, we, I mean, the speed limit is uh, generally applicable to any, any 
uh, the probability distribution changes, so it gives the same bound. It, it gives uh, this same same bound. Actually, so this this data, I mean, this data point actually calculated from this discrete one bin model. So when we calculate this one bin model, of course there is a finite. Uh, this each point has a finite uh, some error epsilon here. So the all data points are above this uh, the symmetrical bound. So it holds for I mean any any case, even with it has uh, an error. So I mean this this data point is calculated when the uh, erasing process time is uh, relatively long, and in, in this case, the data points are calculated when the erasing process time is relatively short. So it actually it contains, I mean, any, almost any possibility. So. Uh, is it possible to extend this result to uh, discrete time model chains? Discrete time Markov chain. What do you mean? I mean, I I drive this so one. These are continuous time Markov chains, right? Yeah, I drive this from the Markov process. Yeah. Yeah, but the main ingredients here seems to be mostly of time uh, uh, information theory. So the fact that you can bound that Kuba fiber divergence yes. is obviously connected with entropy induction mm -hmm. and the total variation, which is connected to a certain. So I was wondering whether that there is possibility to extend this formalism of these results to process which step discrete in time of general Markov chain. Uh, Markov chain. Um, yeah, yes, I mean, if we can define distribution, then we can. I mean, this is a general for any. I mean, we, if even. Uh, so if we can define a distribution at certain time, then we can apply these theories to any, I mean, any system. Here, in this case, actually, you use the fact that you have a differential, okay, a differential equation for the probability, right? So you keep time integrals. So yes. So the question is whether if you have a process which has transition matrices which step time, no. In this case, you can, you can also write this kind of thing. Yes, I think so, yeah. yeah. So I don't understand your point. So, so, so it's a discrete time Markov process. If you write down the ah, discrete time. Yeah. Uh, discrete time. Ah, uh, ah, yeah, I got the point. Ah, uh, uh, yes, discrete time. Yes. So maybe there's some e, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, I got the point, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, <clears throat> um, I have a question. In the course screen, the pit model, uh, yes, hit there, you show that there is uh, the the bound is not tight. Yes. And is there any other good way to? Uh, is there any other good course screening method to get tight bound? Um, so <coughs> in in this yes. scheme, okay, okay. So uh, in in this scheme, actually, I mean, if we use the 
relation we have derived, then uh, I think uh, it is actually, this is a, uh, we cannot avoid, I mean, this gap. Because, I mean, this term uh, comes from, we neglect some intra-entropy production. So uh, the, in, the, the meaning of this intra-entropy production is that entropy production, which is produced inside in one coarse-grained uh, one, one coarse -grained state. So because we, we cannot avoid this and intra-entropy production, so actually, if there is a cost graining, then there should be some, some gap here. Then, then if you make more state, then uh -huh. the gap will be... Probably, yeah, probably, I think yeah. so, yes. Thank you. Uh, a simple question regarding uh, the the erasing process example. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I see the picture, uh, that there is always the step where the, the the energy barrier is resetted to the initial configuration. Here. Yeah, yes. So is that a necessary procedure? No, not necessary. But <laughs> so, but I mean, uh, this is not necessary because I mean, okay. Um, but I think. Uh, so whole process for erasure is if we start from this state, this energy level state, and I think uh, it is natural to think to return back to the original state. I think uh, it's a natural way to think the erasing process. Uh, so the so reason why I wonder is that, uh, so, uh, so in my point of view, the e it, this becomes erasing process because for, so for the initial process, uh, so both sides has a, a same probability to yeah. have the particle. Mm -hmm. And the, the, that information is erased because after, after that energy barrier, there's only one side which, where the particle resides. So as I see it, at the last step, that kind of uh, two, two, two possible states we reborn again, so, so my question is, like, can we really call that erasing process? So, I mean, the erasing process is uh, uh, defined in this way. So, it is uh, um, some uh, losing the information of the, I mean, the previous state. Th that's the erasing process. So, uh, regardless of the initial state, so if the final, st I mean, from the final state, if we cannot guess uh, the, I mean, the, the previous state, then actually we can say that information is erased. So, um, so uh, regardless of the initial state, actually the final state is in the uh, zero state, so we can say that this is an erasing process.